Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in today again on the Subo Survivor Show. And I'm super excited to be able to sit down again with Dr. Jason Horlick. Um, I interviewed him in the past about probiotics and kind of going over some details and some nuances about how to use those if you're dealing with intestinal issues, specifically IBS and SIBO. But today I brought him on and I wanted to, to chat about um, the topic of antibiotics and herbal antibiotics, just because this topic I think um, people need to become more educated on because you know there can be risks with these things and it's best if you kind of go into this with the right approach and the right questions to talk to your doctor about as well. So um, if you didn't see the previous episode with probiotics, feel free to check it out, but I'll do another little quick uh, intro about Dr. Jason Horlick. So he's a naturopath, um, an herbalist, nutritionist, and a gastrointestinal consultant. And he's considered one of the leading experts in the treatment of gastrointestinal conditions um, with natural medicines. So his passion for gastrointestinal health, the microbiota and probiotics was ignited during the final year of his naturopathic training. And then subsequently he did honors and PhD degrees in the areas of gastrointestinal microbiota, IBS, and the clinical applications of pre and probiotics. And he's written extensively in Australian and international textbooks and journals on these topics. So he is the perfect person to ask about, you know, how, how antibiotics and herbal antibiotics can have an effect on these, you know, on the microbiota and on these, you know, your population of bacteria. So um, welcome, Dr. Horlick, and thanks so much for joining me again. Uh, thanks, Josh. It's a pleasure to be back on your show again. Definitely. So I guess, is there anything else you want to add about yourself before we get going? Uh, I mean, I think that was, was probably <laughs> a lot of information. It's probably yeah. too much. Um, I mean, I think the only thing I'd flag is that I'm, I'm a, I've been a naturopathic clinician for that, that time period too. So I've been in practice for nearly 20 years um, and, and essentially I graduated in 1999 and started doing my research looking at gut microbiome at, at that time point. And particularly we were looking at the impact of herbs on the microbiota as part of my, my PhD project, which was done in the early 2000s. So um, I've been fascinated with the, the interactions between diet, herbs, prebiotics, probiotics, and the microbiome for that, for that whole time. Um, and it's fed in really well to my clinical practice, which is just related these days. Very cool. So let's just start off first. Um, I just want to kind of discuss with you, um, I guess when you're, when you have a patient or you're seeing someone, um, who's having these intestinal issues, um, IBS, or maybe they've done a breath test and they're showing SIBO. Um, so how do you determine what goes through your thinking and your diagnosis, um, your diagnostic process um, to determine if it'll be beneficial for someone to use um, antibiotics or herbal antibiotics? Um, just because, I, and I think a lot of people these days with the term SIBO um, are focusing a lot on just killing. So I wanna kind of um, just understand when, how you decide it's best to use antimicrobials in this treatment process. Okay, and, and I do think it depends on, on what they're presenting with. And, and I think a lot of the, my first consultation is really about taking a, a thorough case and hearing their story and trying to pick out details because you're a bit like a digestive detective is how I often explain it to people that we're really trying to work out what's going on, what's causing these symptoms because there's a whole range of, of different, you know, gut, conditions and diseases that can cause bloating, distension, abdominal pain, changes in bowel patterns. So um, I think it's foremost, it's not just making assumptions or self-diagnoses, but, but actually getting um, a good clinician involved that can actually help determine what's going on. I think, I think that's, that's the key. And once you do the right suite of tests, um, then I think we clearly know what's going on. And, and if I can, you can discern, you know, SIBO cases that are presenting with a label of IBS versus um, a post-infectious IBS that might actually have the same symptoms picture, but actually are very similar, um, but not have any SIBO component. So a post-infectious IBS that doesn't have SIBO, I'm not going to use herbal 
or any sort of antimicrobial treatment versus um, a, a positive SIBO, then, then I, I often, in the vast majority of my cases that present with a positive SIBO test, we will use herbal antimicrobials. I think there's the odd exception of, of kids, young kids particularly who have a hard time dealing with foul tasting tinctures that I prescribe. And um, the, those extremely sensitive adults that uh, by the time they see me have, you know, had years of, of treating with other people that uh, and the result where they're at now is they can't handle sulfates or amines or um, um, oxalates or this whole range of different things. And they're eating like eight foods and it, it's far harder to work with because the tools that, that you know would affect them, they're, they're super reactive to. So, and those people, it's about finding the right, right herbs for them in the right form and the right dose, which is not as straightforward as it is for people earlier on in their SIBO journey. Gotcha. So um, basically it sounds like first year, you want to make sure that they have SIBO, right? Because you're saying that some people can have, you know, these, these issues, let's say it's post-infectious IBS and maybe they don't, they don't present with SIBO when you do testing or whatever. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that that's huge because you might have someone that goes to Bali or Mexico, gets trial with diarrhea, and then their gut's never well since. You know, so I think there's a few things that we need to tease out about that. Is, is one, is, is the bug that made them sick still present, which can, can occur. Um, two, SIBO can occur post travelist diarrhea or, or food poisoning event. Um, but you can also just get post-infectious IBS where you've got this residual inflammation and damaged nerves in your gut that isn't SIBO related, um, but it was caused by that initiating um, infectious agent, which is gone. Um, and we Antimicrobials are going to be useless, and actually, I'd argue, if you're using the wrong ones, it's going to be harmful for for the healing process and getting that gut working properly. Versus um, the scenario where there's a it's the uh, an infection agent is still present, then we will we'll target that, and then obviously, if SIBO is present on on testing, then then we'll target that. And I think herbal antimicrobials have a, have a key role in that in that scenario. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important because you know. Step one is just making sure, right, that you have SIBO or that you have some type of infectious um, organism going on. Because like you're saying, you know, you can be having these symptoms without having that bacterial overgrowth. Yeah, that, that's huge. And, and, and there's so many people that, I, that I've worked with over the years and, and um, who make, or, or for me, the self, self-diagnosis, I suppose, that they got got sick all overseas and therefore the bugs are still present or it's, it's obviously SIBO because of something they read in the blogosphere and they haven't been properly tested. And and you do see pa- patients that have essentially self-restricted their diet dramatically, taking lots of pharmaceutical and um, you know self-prescribed herbal antimicrobials that have left their gut in far worse state than what it ever was be- before they, they commenced treatment. So I, I yeah, I, I appreciate the importance of actually working at exactly what's what's going on and not, not making assumptions based on, on sometimes the initiated event or symptoms because so many conditions can present with, with those you know, very vague, essentially, um, symptoms from, from a gut perspective. Yeah, definitely. Very important. So um, next, uh, so basically when you've decided it's going to be beneficial, let's say someone is presenting with SIBO or you know, an infectious organism um, and you've decided it's beneficial that you know, you can target either herbal antibiotics or conventional antibiotics. Um, Like what is your, what is the typical um, timeline for using these type of um, drugs essentially or antimicrobial? Yeah. And and I should probably clarify that too, that in Australia, naturopathic clinicians don't have pharmaceutical prescribing rights. So, so, and and that's where where I, where I practice from. So, I, I don't ever <laughs> prescribe pharmaceutical anti- right. antibiotics. I just yeah. use herbal antimicrobials um, and, and pre and probiotics and, and dietary changes to the core of the way that I approach SIBO. And in the very rare cases that that approach doesn't work, I'll, I'll consider um, the, the suitability of, of, of re- referring onwards for, for um, what I would see bigger gun treatment um, with pharmaceutical antimicrobials. But thankfully, that I can't think my practice is extremely rare. Yeah. So you're saying, I guess you're saying that for the most part, right, herbal antimicrobials can be just as effective as these other pharmaceutical options from your experience, right? Well, they're effective. And I suppose because I don't use a pharmaceutical, I can't say they're (laughs) one way or the other, but I can say that in the vast, vast majority of patients, herbal 
my antimicrobials work. And I think sometimes it's a matter of finding the right herbs for that person because we're limited with the technology we have for, for a diagnosis with the SIBO. We're using breath tests, which, um, you know, they're, they're, they're of debatable accuracy, but I mean, I, I do rely on them in practice. And what they will tell you is that there's bacteria making hydrogen or methane in your small bowel or not. Do they tell you what species are involved with that? No, not really. So you can get a bit of data around methane and going, okay, you're a methane producer, then yes, you've probably got methane or river bacteria, smithy eye as, as, a, as a key um, player in that scenario. So that, that's a useful bit of data, but otherwise we're not. So we're having to guess what species are involved. And then we try to target our herbs to go, okay, what are the most likely, well, that's how I approach it anyway. It's what are the most likely species we find in people with SIBO? And then I choose the herbs based on that data. But it's not, we, we can only individualize that so much because we don't have that that specific data for that patient, let alone um, not even, the, we know the antimicrobial susceptibilities go, go beyond species, but down to strain specificity for that patient. You know, So I, I would say that sometimes we need to do a bit of trial and error to get the right herbs for that, for that person um, because their, their overgrowth, the bacterial strains that are, that, that are involved with their overgrowth are unique to them and, and therefore will may, may well display unique attributes now. Luckily, most people will respond to a set of herbs that I would typically use, um, but there will always be a small percentage that don't, uh, which require a little bit more trial and error to get there. Gotcha. So you're trying to determine basically, you know, the organisms that are caused or the gases that are being produced and the organisms that they have. And then from there, you're deciding what type of herbal antimicrobials can be the most effective for this person. Yeah, and, and the way I do breath testing, um, I, I do. I don't just use lactulose. I use lactulose, glucose, and fructose. So three, three sugars. Uh, one because I think we get a. Uh, I, can, I can say clinically, you get a much better accuracy rate that the number of people I see flatline on lactulose, but then spike on glucose or fructose, particularly fructose, because it's huge. And if I just use LBT, I'd actually miss miss the diagnosis because lactulose is, is a selectively fermented substrate. Only some gut bacteria can ferment it. So you're, you're limiting to what it's going to pick up pretty dramatically if you just rely on lactulose for one. Um, and, and two, that can give us data. Because if, if you have microbes in your gut that don't eat lactulose but do eat fructose or glucose, then it gives me a bit more of an idea of what species might be there and, and how to target. And conversely, if I have bugs that eat all three sugars, then I might, might select my herbs a little bit differently based on that. So I, I find those breast tests can be helpful for, for obviously diagnosis primarily, but you can get a little bit of data around um, Gu that guides the use of, of herbal medicines as well, not just the hydrogen methane perspective, but also what substrates are used by the microbes. Very cool. And it's, you know, very complex and fascinating. So um, I guess my question is, and a lot of people are probably wondering is like, do you have, let's say a few herbs for each type of, um, you know, gas that's produced? Like how do you usually go about selecting these herbs? Yeah, so, so it does, does go back to what I sort of laid out before, but, but because we can't work out what species are there, yeah. um, bar, bar methane or beverbacter, then we're, we're sort of working on, on other research that is, has that is essentially sampled people's small bowel and go, okay, what do those studies say? What sort of correlates to, with the, those common species that are found in people's small bowel that have SIBO? And then that's what I'll be basing that on. So I, I think there are some herbs that, that tend to, um, ba based on some research I did as part of my PhD, but looking at the broader um, herbal antimicrobial um, research that's out there, and there's actually a fair bit out there, most of it sadly just in vitro at this time point, but um, with for very, because of the cost involved with doing actual human research. Um, so, so there's a number of herbs that I would use commonly, like, like pomegranate husk, and I would use oregano, um, clove, and thyme would be very common herbs I would use to treat both methane dominant SIBO and, and hydrogen dominant, um, as well, well as garlic. And we know that, that Allison rich garlic extracts are, can, can be useful for both types of SIBO. And, and the cool thing is, is that we know that garlic, um, from other research and certainly some that I did as part of my PhD is very selective in terms of microbes that it, that it killed off. So I'm not worried about it having collateral damage effect on the ecosystem. And, and also the same with pomegranate husk, is, is clearly based on the data we have selected and how it works. And then with the other herbs that I would commonly use, like the oregano, the, the clove, and the thyme, the form that it's in is immensely important. And that if we choose a form like an enteric coated essential oil form, we're getting super concentrated uh, up the, the, the antimicrobial components. 
super concentrated up of, of those a little a small suite of the phytochemicals of those herbs, which makes them extremely potent, um, and and I'd say not very selective, um, yeah. and, and how they actually work. Um, so for me, I, I much I use tinctures, um, and tinctures where we've chosen the alcohol percentage and um, carefully so that we're extracting out some of the volatiles, but we're also getting the other polyphenols. And that's what's missing with the intercoated preparations. And the polyphenols um, have antimicrobial effects as well, but they're selective. And we've got lower concentration of the volatile oils that are less, that aren't selective. So essentially I find that we can get the, the best components of those herbs. And I think they may well take a little bit longer to work than the concentrated up intercoated essential oils, but you don't get vital damage. To the clonic ecosystem and and that i think is is huge particularly when we're looking at, at long term not just trying to get your symptoms reduced for two weeks but let's go <laughs> what do we want to do to to prevent this from happening long term what do we want to do to to improve your overall health long term and i think that so much stems from microbiota nourishment and microbiota care um, and i think that's where the points of herbs are really important whether we're using agents that are going to damage the clonic ecosystem and potentially long term versus agents that are selective and, and leave the good guys intact in the colon. Yeah, very interesting. So I'm actually studying herbal medicine a little bit myself. And so basically when you tincture, right, like you're pulling out different extractives and you're saying that the polyphenols, are they acting as, are they feeding good microbes? Is that how they act as a buffer? Or, yeah, yeah it, polyphenols are, are very cool compounds because in, in general they they exhibit antimicrobial effects. Uh, against um, pathogens and, and gram-negative food spoilage and, and food poisoning type bacteria, which is, and, and some of these ones we see commonly in SIBO. Um, and on the other hand, the polyphenols do work as food sources for our beneficial anti-inflammatory gut species as well. So you, you get that, that double aspect to them, which I think is very cool. Very cool, yeah. And then, so you're saying with the enteric-coated you know, oil capsules that someone would take, they don't they're a little more destructive because they don't have those other extractives, right? Yeah, and, and the concentration is, is, is much higher too. I mean, if, if I took you know a big bottle of oregano tincture yeah. <laughs> in, in one dose, I reckon I would get the same sort of destructive qualities from, from these volatile components as I get from you know, an enteric coated capsule. It's just the quantity, because the amount of oregano that goes into making one of those tiny capsules is huge. You, know, you couldn't sit down and eat a plate of oregano um, you, you would get sick and feel horrible to eat that much oregano to get the amount that's in that in that capsule. And the tincture is an in-between um, concentration. So we use alcohol, often we're using you know, 60% ethanol or alcohol to extract out the quantity of the volatiles, but we're also getting those lovely polyphenols at the same time. Um, and it's slightly more concentrated up than just chew, you know, chewing on the you know, plate of oregano. Um, but, and, and we, we probably get a slightly higher concentration of the volatiles because we're using um, alcohol out of the solvent. But what we do, as I said, it, it just, they tend to work more selectively. And I've done so much in the way of pre approached um, microbiome assessment with, with my patients that, that I, I've seen this clinically over the years too, which has been brilliant to see. Yeah, really cool. So basically, um, you know, you've decided at this point in our kind of our conversation, um, you know, selecting the proper herbal antimicrobial based on someone's, you know, gases and their, you know, their, the bacteria that's, that's causing issues. Um, and then another, another thing that people probably, you know, need help or need help understanding is timelines with these things, because, um, you know, there are people out there who maybe take number of different protocols a um, few times. And so what are your kind of guidelines on timelines that you use these protocols? Is it like a month and then you take a couple months off? Uh, how do you go about the timeline? Yeah, so for me, we would, a typical treatment pattern for someone that has a, a very positive clear SIBO diagnosis um, would probably be about 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks. Yeah, and and, um, as I mentioned before, I, th I think about the herbs that I tend to use in the tincture form for, for many people work probably slightly on a slower rate um, than what a mega bomb of berberine and mega bomb of, of essential oil capsules will actually do. Um, I would say that the, you know, I do get people that get relief in a week or two, but the median time is around week four. 
I don't know why, but that's something I can say from working with hundreds of patients is week four, something switches and all of a sudden their gut symptoms go um, or start to start diminishing rapidly from that, that time point. Um, and then we, we continue on that for longer than that. And, and through trial and error with, with patients, I've worked at that, that, that 12 week span is generally good that if I stopped it at week six, um, then symptoms would come back in a certain proportion of people relatively quickly. But when I do it for that period of time, it would generally be mission for a longer time period for most patients. Then we would move them on to a, a maintenance phase that might be around, you know, using prokinetics, et cetera, to, to just help make sure things are moving, make sure they're pooing frequently, make sure they're eating the right, the right things and avoiding the, the wrong things that will, that will essentially have a greater risk of bringing SIBO back. Yeah. So yeah. is there really like, how long would you say is too long? If, if you're going over 12 weeks or if someone is taking like, you know, herbal antimicrobials for longer than, you know, let's say two or three months. Is that just too much? Like what, what do you advise people on, on those? Issues? Yeah. yeah, no, th those are, those are a good question. And it really does depend on what they're taking. Yeah. yeah. So if you're taking megadoses of berberine, then three months of, of megadoses of berberine will cause um, negative shifts to ecosystems. I've certainly seen it. And I've seen that even, you know, er completely eradicate bifidobacteria from people. So it did seem from that, from that, that wow. so I think with certain herbal protocols we need to be more more cautious with mine for the occasion person I need to go over that I'm not particularly worried about that because I've done enough testing um, to be, be confident that we're not causing collateral damage to the colonic ecosystem but when it comes to the, the volatile oil um, you know essential oil and terra coated products with megadoses of the berberine then I think there's got to be more caution around the duration of time that you, you you take it you can always do you know microbiome assessments every you know if if money is not such an issue and you're very curious you can do one every couple of weeks and go okay what impact is it having um sadly there's going to be a couple of week delay even if you're in your north america to, to probably find out what the impact is um but it will help probably get a bit of a feel for how things are, are going but i've got more caution around the more potent um, non-selectively acting antimicrobials for, for more than three months. And it possibly might do much um, sooner than that. And, and for me, it's more a matter of, because I'm not using those, those tools for that time period in practice. So I, 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 what, I, what I've observed is, is the microbiome um, assessments pre and post for people that are seeing other practitioners taking those medications and going, okay, this is what the consequence has been. You had a massive loss of diversity and no, no longer have bifidobacteria and your butyrate producing microbes have decreased dramatically. Yeah. Very, you know, I think it's, I think it's important. And, um, it's something that I, even as I learn more about the microbiome, like, you know, I think it's important to do a pre and a post, you know, when you use any type of herbal antibiotic or any antibiotic, just to see what kind of a shift you've, you know, amassed in your system. Um, yeah. And then to see how well you've, you've gone to, to restore things back as, as to the best of your capacity. I, I think it, and it just brings awareness to the, of the importance of that ecosystem. Um, and I think that's, that's grown a lot. I mean, really when I started, reading my first microbiome papers in 1999, there, there weren't that many people that were passionate about the importance of this ecosystem and, and protecting it, you know, I will we'll call cost because it's uh, such a vital, um, you play so many vital roles in your overall functioning. And, and it's, I think it's really challenging to, to be optimally vital if your ecosystem is shot really. Um, and we have plenty of data showing that that's the case now. So um, I think if we're doing anything that brings awareness of the importance of this ecosystem and, cherishing it and looking after it and then nurturing it after we have to use agents that, you know, there are times and places for using antibiotics. They save lives, they save limbs, um, save organs. <laughs> Otherwise we, we, we'd lose them. Um, in which case we need to take them. But then I think it's looking, okay, how can we, we minimize the damage and help repair it afterwards? It's got to be huge on our, our agenda. And I think we just need to flag that, that herbal medicine, some have got the capacity to cause damage to the gut ecosystem too. And I'd say not as much as, thankfully as, as most antibiotics would do um, and perhaps need to take it higher doses for longer periods of time before we'd see those sort of um, similar sort of shifts, but it should be something that's on our radar as um, both users and prescribers of, of herbal medicines. Yeah. So, I mean, talking about the, the maintenance or, you know, helping not to cause major issues while you're doing these things. So is there anything like, do you usually use pre and probiotics alongside these protocols and do they help um, this, you know, prevent this alteration? 
I, I would suggest yes. I, I think for me, using pre and probiotics in my sleep treatment is, is something I've always done, which probably is somewhat unique to some practitioners out there um, and some patients' ears too, because I know that, that in some circles they're they're controversial. Not not for me, based on the research data that we have, nor in, in my clinical experience that we get good results using them. So, um, and I, and I would see prebiotic by part to hydrolyzed guar gum would be a core aspect of, of treatment of SIBO, whether it's hydrogen dominant or, or methane dominant. For example, we, we know from research that it brings down methane overproduction. We know that. We also know that it improves the efficacy of, of um, antimicrobials for hydrogen dominant SIBO. So it's like, how can we, <laughs> you know, those are both good outcomes. Plus it's gonna help protect and nurture some of those butyrate producing bacteria in, in the colon that might otherwise be get, getting a bit of a rough trot. So yeah, for, for me, it's a bit of a no brainer to use that. Now there is occasional, occasional person that, that can't tolerate that, but thankfully it's extremely rare and most SIBO patients can, most patients I guess, can, can take that well, unlike some other sort of prebiotic fibers that might need a bit of gut priming first <laughs> before they're capable of doing. But that's one that is, and there's certainly a, a huge body or a growing body of research, and I think quite substantial now, showing the benefits of taking probiotics alongside um, or as a component of SIBO treatment, or even just as SIBO treatment based on some of the data that's there. There was a lovely meta-analysis published, I think it was last year, where they looked at the probiotics and, and SIBO treatment, and the, the data was clear that these are, these are useful agents to, to help with SIBO. I think the reality is we, as clinicians, have to be more selective in terms of just going, yeah, just take a probiotic, this will work, it's multi-strain, high CFU. It's like, no, <laughs> choose the strain that has the right action that's going to help this patient, you know, um, that's got data showing is helpful for the treatment of, of SIBO or for speeding up transit time or for healing up a damaged gut. If we, we choose probiotics well, we get much better results and better tolerability as well. Yeah, so, so with the... Have you seen well, with your pre and post microbiome assessment tests, if, if, you're, if you're giving someone a treatment and you also, you know, tell them to take pre or probiotics alongside their herbal antimicrobials, do you see um, a difference in the shift at all? Have you seen that? Well, I've never not done it, <laughs> so I can't, I can't say yeah. that. It's like I, my <laughs> protocol always, has always included it, and I'm not going to go, oh, I'm curious what impact it has by, by or deprive you of this treatment that's probably going to help and protect you and do that for a few patients. I'm not, I'm not going to do that for my patients, so uh, we, I won't have that. that uh, yes, that's interesting because the people who probably you know, don't do it probably don't want to get the data, right? So it's, it's, it's interesting. Huh? Um, yeah, and, and I do wish there's more of that done by, by practitioners treating SIBO to going, like, what, what impact is it having on the clonic ecosystem? Um, and, and for me, from, from, from my research, was, was I was just fell in love with the clonic microbiota from the, when I started doing, delving into the research from the late 90s, early 2000s. And, uh, and it's just so vital for good health that, that I really all have, have flagged since that time. And particularly since when I did some of that research looking at herbs and their ability to, to damage you know, good species in the gut back in that early time window too of going, you know, this, we should be aware of this and we really need to, to cherish this ecosystem and, and avoid the use of agents that will cause harm unless they are necessary. And we've tried these other things first. And it goes back to this idea, in naturopathic medicine, we talk about this idea of a therapeutic spectrum, that we use agents that are least, that are going to be affected and least likely to cause harm first before we move further over into the, the, harm, the more harmful agents. And there are times where we have to start, as I mentioned before, in that, that, that range because it's going to save this person's life. But there are other times where we're working in, like, we've got a window here. We don't have to pull up the big guns yet. We can actually work with agents that are um, safer, more selective, less likely to cause harm first. Yeah, so, so speaking of selective and non-selective agents, um, can we just discuss which herbal antibiotics are more destructive to beneficial bacteria and which ones have a more selective action? Yeah, so, so that was one of the, the, the things I was curious about. As part right. of, as, so we did some research on that in my, in my PhD. So there's some data that's coming out of there and there's other data now that's starting to look at that. Now, if you look at that, most of the data looking at herbs and as antimicrobials, they're, they're really interested in what it killed. So they're only testing to get pathogens. And it's, it's only more recently they were going, okay, what impact do these herbs have on the beneficial bugs? So that's been nice to see that, that field blooming over the last, last few years. But before that, all we had was more destructive, <laughs> destructive data. But my, my research, I think, was, was pretty fascinating because we took a, a you know, representative um, 
species that 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 were were seen to be prominent in people's guts um, based on, on 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 the data we had back in the early 2000s and we essentially just exposed them to different concentrations of, of a range of herbs that were typically used as you know antimicrobials or or just for gut disorders more, more broadly like peppermint essential oil and we wanted to see what impact it would actually have on the growth of that species, whether it would inhibit it or not. So it was fascinating from my perspective because we come up with ones like garlic that was very selective. You know, you could get a dose of garlic that would, you know, inhibit the growth of pathogens completely, but leave the vast majority of bugs, particularly all the, the, the you know, beneficial microbes like Bifidobacteria, Lactobacillus, for example, alone, which, which was great. And uh, we also looked at, at caraway oil and an Ayurvedic herb called Ajwan, and that also seemed to have... Um, selective activity, even though we looked at the essential oil component, at the doses, at a certain dose, we could actually find a uh, preparation that was good at killing off the, you know, pathogens, but left the good guys intact. And other research, as I mentioned before, has shown pomegranate husk to be a fantastic agent for, for a range of, of both fungal and bacterial and protozoal infections, but leaves you know, bifidobacteria, actually encourages bifidobacteria growth and, and it's benign to lactobacillus it's, it's, and has you know, got anti-inflammatory effects. It's a pr very cool herb and yeah. very underutilized herb, which is starting to change, I must say. But yeah, I've been you know, pounding on about the, the wonders of Congregate House for the last decade and it's only yeah. commercially available more so in the last couple of years, thankfully. They, what the research was saying and then there was herbs that were not selective at, uh, really much at all and those were the berberine containing herbs you know so people often think of berberine as, as a substance it is one alkaloid that's found in a number of herbs like golden seal and coptis chinensis to be two that are probably more, more commonly used um, and that those herbs were not particularly selective. That the dose we were using that would kill pathogens would also kill off beneficial bacteria, particularly bifidobacteria, was very susceptible to, to berberine, for example. Uh, and then oregano oil was, was good at killing most things. <laughs> Bar yeah. lactobacilli, we could find a dose that was um, acceptable for killing pathogens like, like Candida elbicans, for example, that didn't kill lactobacilli. So I've used oregano for, um, vaginal thrush, for example, and we can, because there we want lactobacilli, but we don't want candida. So we can use the right preparation of the right form and, and get good results in that, that regard. And then things like peppermint oil and fennel oil um, that were not particularly selective. So the, the, the dose required to cause antimicrobial effects killed good guys as well as, you know, um, potential pathogens. And then last but not least, I should have to mention grape seed extract or, or citrus seed extract as a natural <laughs> Yeah. preparation um, and I put that in quotation marks purposely because we know it's generally spiked with triclosan and benthodium chloride and methylparaben which is why it is, 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 is so effective as it was and it killed everything at tiny doses everything wow. across the board even more so than our positive control which was clindamycin which is a more potent uh, antibiotics that you can use but this was far greater than that but it's not natural I think that's the thing that people need to flag um, yeah. taking author grade disinfectants <laughs> Yeah. type chemicals um which not not recommended um in general and certainly not from a, a gut microbiota damaging standpoint yeah it's crazy so it's it's with that it's probably just the chemicals killing bacteria yeah. right? the, but... it is the researchers actually tried to to make uh, an antimicrobial compound out of citrus seed and they yeah. could not, no matter how they prepared it. Um, what makes them? And the, and the, they did a market basket survey. So the products in, on the, the North American market that didn't, that weren't spiked with these chemicals, did not have any antimicrobial activity at all. And really, the, the, all the antimicrobial activity was due to the triclosan and benthodium chloride. Yeah, interesting. So definitely stay away from that one. <laughs> yes. Yes. So when you're, you know, when you're using these, I think you kind of already mentioned it before, but do you, do you usually start with the selective ones and then like kind of work your way, last case scenario, move towards the more destructive ones? Is that how you approach it? It is. It's okay. definitely how I approach it. And, and thankfully, we're generally able to get it there, even if it's not the first, first go, but the second or third go, we're able to still, still choose primarily selective acting agents before um, and get results. So seldom have I had to um, take my, my fallback position, which would be high doses of the berberine and um, enteric essential oils. Seldom have had to. Yeah, and then the other interesting thing that you kind of discussed was how, you know, the type, the form you take it in, right? Whether it's a tincture or a powder or, you know, an essential oil capsule. Um, so you're saying that 
all of those different extractions have a different effect on the microbiome, right? For certain herbs, definitely, that would be the case. So if you look at, at uh, oregano, at a case in point, that if you, if you grind up some lovely dried sort of, I'm just looking because I've got some oregano growing right out there. <laughs> um, but if you, if you dry it out and mill it up and then encapsulate it, you're going to get everything. You're going to get some fibers, you're going to get, um, which is going to feed some beneficial microbes. You're going to get the um, polyphenols and yeah. you're going to get some volatile components. Yeah, so that that actually is, I think, it a very effective and safe way of taking oregano. Like my, my clonic microbiota safe, I should, should say explicitly. Um, the tea. The tea actually will, will select out the polyphenols, but not much of the volatiles. You get a little bit of the volatiles floating on the water. Most of it has like steamed into the air. That's why you can smell it. And there's a good chunk of it left in the herb. Yeah, yeah. so you're not going to get much of that, but you're going to get more polyphenols. So that can be... Uh, and I've used oregano tea to treat SIBO before in some patients too. And you can get good results using the right herb as tea. Um, and you're relying more on the polyphenols to do the, the sort of killing than you are the volatiles, but there's a little bit there. Now with tinctures, it depends on the alcohol percentage. Now, if you use a low alcohol, you don't pull out the volatiles very well with the yeah. essential oils, but you use 50, 60% ethanol like we do. You actually pull out the volatile oils, but you also get the polyphenols. And as I said, for me, this is the happy, <clears throat> the happy medium, easy to take, <clears throat> no, no preparation involved. You know, you just take it down a shot of the stuff. It tastes foul, but it's, it's otherwise easy to take. Yeah. And um, we're getting the, the benefits of both those categories of herbal compounds, whereas the volatile oil, we're only, or sort of yeah, the enteric code essential oils, we're just getting a super concentrated volatile oil and we're leaving everything else behind. And you will get different impacts on the gut with the different preparations. Yeah, definitely. And like we discussed before, adding the other extractives like the polyphenols that you get from the alcohol concentration, these these kind of work as a buffer. Is that correct? To I don't know, but actually maybe not a buffer, but like they work to kind of protect beneficial bacteria a little bit more. Is that I'd I'd see it that way, and and because they are, the polyphenols do work as food sources for for our beneficial species in our gut, um, but you're also but they're also working as antimicrobials. Yeah, I got you. At, in the same, and they're also working as antibiofilm agents against pathogens too. So it's like we're, we're getting the, an additional suite suite of actions from these from these compounds um, that that are some we're improving the antimicrobial activity i'd say making it broader in terms of the, the compounds that are that are there working but then we're also getting these comp this similar compounds uh, having a dual role of actually feeding and nurturing up some of the species in our colon as well yeah definitely so if someone if someone uses herbal antimicrobials and they work effectively but then you know they relapse and this, their symptoms come back what um as far as like a guideline for future treatments with herbal antimicrobials, do you, do you usually allow a certain period of time after a treatment? Um, what is kind of that, what does that look like? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think if there was a very quick return, <clears throat> then, then I would actually go right back on, onto the treatment with that was working before. I would see it as insufficient treatment duration that we're able to knock back numbers, but not actually Illuminate would be the wrong word, but knock back enough. And, and that I'd be thinking, okay, let's look at the, the maintenance strategy that we've devised for you hasn't worked. You know, if the symptoms come back two weeks later, I'd see it mostly as a matter that we haven't done treatment for duration for long enough. If it came back six or eight weeks later, looking at, okay, what's wrong with our maintenance strategy? What have we done? Or what have, what have you accidentally done <laughs> that may well have, have inadvertently brought this heat back? Like, you know, I've had patients where uh, binge drinking was was the yeah. driver of SIBO returning and they yeah. just Christmas and New Year's so they just drink more than they otherwise would have and then boom SIBO comes back in early early January and that was the driver so it wasn't as if the, the protocol maintenance protocol wasn't working it was just they couldn't deal with with the effects of alcohol stopping you know slowing small bowel motility um, and selecting for the growth of uh, gram negative proteobacteria um, in, in the small bowel which is what alcohol tends to do. Okay. So I, yeah, I guess, so if you're going to, let's say, you know, like, like my question, if you're going to, if someone did the treatment and it came back, like you're saying after a couple of weeks, like you don't, you don't really have an issue like treating them again. Like I, I, I wouldn't, yeah. but I'm also using herbs that I, that I, I know aren't going to cause that sort of collateral damage. Okay. Yeah, so I would be in a different mindset if, um, if I was using high doses of burning or, yeah. or enterocode essential oil preparations that, that, that had herbs that weren't 
selective in, in, in terms of the herbs there were and the dose that they were in, then I'd have caution around frequent use because um, I've cl certainly clinically seen patients, and particularly this would be a combination of being on very you know, plant fiber restricted diets yeah. and then doing herbal antimicrobials and sometimes plus or minus some, some rifaxin and some other antibiotics occasionally thrown into the mix and their, their gut function deteriorates. Yeah, the, the SIBO might have, have you know, temp gone, but their, their colon is far worse and their symptoms uh, are worse than what they were ever to, to begin with. Um, and I think that's due to the, 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 the overall damage that's happened to the colonic ecosystem. Um, increasing colonic inflammation because we've managed to, to not feed or, and or kill off the beetroot producing microbes and bifidobacteria who play a key role in, in healing, um, and keeping the, the colon functioning properly and protecting against visceral hypersensitivity and, and, and nerve inflation in the colon, for example. So I've, I've had more caution around frequency of use in that scenario. Yeah, gotcha. So yeah, that's, I guess that, that's kind of what I was trying to get at is like, you know, with what you're doing, you're going to be careful with the selective activity. But um, if someone is using more destructive herbal antimicrobials, is it is it wise to space it out and not, you not know, keep doing that, right, for a long time? Yeah, in, in that case, you have to try to, to balance these two things of how much has the return impacted your quality of life. If, if it's just a little bit of bloating and distension has returned, then maybe you could just go in with, you know, if you're doing garlic and berberine and, and integral essential oils, maybe just go in with garlic <laughs> at that point. And then we don't have to worry about the, the killing off, you know, um, clonic bacteria as part of that, that treatment approach. Um, so there might be ways of... of fine tuning the treatment so that we're not going to get that, that damaging aspect. Um, but, but, but it's also, I mean, if your impact of, and your quality of life is huge and your, you know, fatigue is absolutely massive and your you know, depression comes back, roaring back, and then you've got these horrible, you know, gut symptoms as well. It means you can't leave the house. Then, you know, you have to seriously think about how to get out of that hole. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then you look, you weigh up the, the pros and cons of different situations. And that's you look at the previous treatment you took, how effective was it? How long did it last afterwards? Um, is, is there a different way we could have tried approaching it that, that might have longer lasting effects? Yeah, definitely. Very important. And then kind of the last, last thing that, you know, I'm curious about, which is, I think is a good question is, does someone's, I guess, colonic microbiome and, you know, their overall physical health in general have an impact on the way these antimicrobials will work. So like if someone, for example, has certain populations, um, do they have an effect on the herbs that you use? Uh, interesting question. I mean, I, mean I, I do think some of it comes back to what I mentioned before about that individual select uh, antimicrobial susceptibility um, for people. So I, you'd have to argue that, that the ecosystem composition um, will dictate the the efficacy of, of herbal products and, and our argue antibiotics too because we know that you know even um, you know proven antibiotics for, for SIBO don't work for, for a good chunk of people either um, because the, the bugs aren't being impacted by them so I think there's that susceptibility issue that's across the board no matter what any particular agents that your class of agents you're dealing with that that has to be considered um, but I, I think if you're looking at overall vitality um, then obviously I think that that will come into it potentially more so on, on terms of tolerability, I'd say more than anything else, that the people that are that are the most run down and the most damaged to the colonic ecosystem be the ones that are least likely to be able to handle taking herbs and yeah. and products. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where it becomes tricky because I know these agents are going to help, but they 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 will flare up certain symptoms in the short term. So we, we just can't go in there and do that. You have to do lots of prep work first to get to, to the point where um, they can potentially tolerate those agents. Yeah, gotcha. I think I think the reason why I put that question down is because you know in one of your in the lectures I was you know I was studying how or you you put down in one of your lectures how like different you know herbal herbs can affect you know different populations of bacteria and that can have an like a, an effect on the way they work right their actions. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I see your 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 point here too, and. Yeah. Perhaps I'd see that less relevant to SIBO efficacy, but certainly relevant for other, other herbal agents because a, a lot of medicinal herbs rely on polyphenols as their active ingredients. Um, and then 90, 95% of, of those herbal compounds aren't absorbed. 
they reach the colon and essentially it's the colon that actually the clonic bacteria that convert those compounds into something that's medicinal yeah don't have the right species and they can't do that it's not medicinal and you may not get any effects yeah. from that herb yeah, um, like, and, and this i think yeah. that's what yeah. i was getting at i was i was okay. wondering if that had an impact on the herbal antimicrobial treatment i think less so from an antimicrobial perspective but but i think certainly for other herbs that we're using for other conditions or and um more, more broadly because of, of that change in the clonic ecosystem. And I think if you really think about this, is that we've really altered our clonic ecosystem from what we've had from an evolutionary perspective, from you know, C-sections and, and bottle feeding and, and generations of antibiotics, generations of a, of a fibrous Western diet. We've made huge shifts to that. And there's numerous species missing that we used to have. Um, and that could explain why medicinal herbs, some medicinal herbs may not work as well as they used to in previous generations. Or even in, in a study where you include 50 people, if some of those people have taken mega doses of antibiotics and were born by a C-section and formula fed and are missing certain species, it, they may not work for them, but they might work on people that have the right species present. It's, re it's really fascinating to consider all the, these potential ramifications. And, and again, it puts that weight on us as prescribers of going, okay, God, I want to make sure that that one, these species are, are, are around for this person so they can get optimal sort of physiological benefit. Um, secondly, for, the, for further future generations, I want to make sure I don't make these species go extinct so they can't get passed on for, for future generations. And, and also just for future efficacy of other, age, other conditions I might be treating, like maybe I'm treating for SIBO now, but I want to treat them, I will be treating them for menopause in, in yeah. five years' time. Well, I want my herbs that work for menopause to work in five years' time. And if I use really potent antimicrobials and use really restricted plant fi fiberless diets, there's a decent chance that my herbs won't work in five years time because the species that eat those classes of polyphenols may be gone. And I think we need to keep these things in, 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 in our awareness when we're yeah. making decisions around prescribing. Yeah. Wow. So, so much to think about, right? So much, yeah. so much complexity. And, and I think that's why I wanted to chat with you about this because just to show people and educate them about how, you know, you need to use caution and kind of really you know talk to a practitioner or work with a doctor when you're kind of going about these treatments yeah definitely and i think it's it's choosing people that have got the the right knowledge around the tools that they're they're using too yeah um because i think it's easy to just i think there's you know, SIBO, SIBO is popular and there's some people that, that have got more, more training and experience in, in treating it and have more knowledge of herbs. And there's others that, that don't have, have knowledge of herbs and training experience. And I think you're, you're, you're not going to get the same quality of care and finesse with treatment if, you, if you're choosing people that don't have knowledge of herbs to, to provide you with herbs. Yeah. Uh, it's, as, it's as simple as that. Yeah, definitely. And then I guess one last question I thought of, I, I, I need to ask you this is, um, so the conventional, I know you don't use them, but the conventional antibiotics, let's say rifaximin and neomycin, those type of antibiotics, do those, you know, from the research that you've seen, are those a lot more destructive? Because I know there is, there is some talk about, you know, zyfaxin having selective capabilities, right? So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I would put rifaximin as a, in a slightly unique category based on current data, it does appear to be more, far more selective than most antibiotics do. Okay. And it seems to even, some research are having a bit of an additional anti-inflammatory effect as mm -hmm. well. So I think that deserves to be considered a little bit separately um, versus neomycin and, and other antibiotics that, that research tends to show an increased clonic inflammation and expression of inflammatory genes for months after the use um, and, and certainly um, don't display that, that any sort of degree of <laughs> selectivity and have a great, much greater capacity to cause collateral damage to that clonic ecosystem as part of their, their treatment. Um, yeah, but I, but I can't speak from experience of using it and doing pre and post testing. I can only speak from <clears throat> looking at the data, <clears throat> the research that's been done to date, looking at the impact of rifaxin on, on the gut microbiota of, of the patient. There's only been a couple of studies that's looked at that, at least that I'm aware of, um, and it does appear to be more selective. Okay. Very much so compared to simple antibiotics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good to know. Um, well, hey, that's, it's been, it's been so fascinating. And so, you know, I've learned a ton. I always learned a ton talking to you and I just thanks so much for coming on and, you know, helping educate us about, you know, herbal antimicrobials and some of the best practices and cautions people need to take um, with these substances. Oh, it's, it's 
brilliant to chat to you. It's, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And it's yeah. uh, been for me getting, getting the message out there to, to patients and practitioners um, is, is important because we do, it is something that I'm passionate about. And I think we need to, to think more about the long-term implications of, of, of what people, what we're taking or prescribing in many cases. Definitely. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Horlock. All right. Take care, Josh.